Hello, and welcome to the first episode of Open Access Annals. In this series, I look at open access operators and their histories. Open access operators are not bounded by franchise contracts and are entirely ran at the risk of the parent company, so are different from franchised operators. In today's episode, we look at one of the free open access operators along the East Coast mainline currently, Whole Trains. Today, I will look at their history to date, from humble beginnings with a small fleet of just 12 coaches, to where they are today, owned by First Travel, with 25 carriages in their fleet, and with potential route extensions more far from Hull. However, let's start from the beginning, in May 1999. Kingston-upon-Hull, a city with more than 250,000 people in 1999, only had one train to London per day, despite being only half an hour from the East Coast mainline at Selby slash Goole. The difficult practice of having to separate carriages and trains to run direct services to Hull under British Rail, and the decision not to electrify Hull, had left privatised franchise operator Great North Eastern Railway in a position where they could only run one service. The Hull Executive, as it was branded, ran from Hull to London in the morning and ran back to Hull in the evenings, operated by an Intercity 125 set. The service was run by GNER as a continuation of the British Rail Intercity service with the same name. The fact this service ran just once a day left a large opening for potential new services to be ran on the line. With several former BR managers, Mike Jones and John Nelson, applying to the Department for Transport to operate a new open access service from London King's Cross to Hull under their company called Renaissance Trains, being branded as Hull Trains. With an open access operator, which Renaissance Trains' Hull operations would be, they would not be bound by government contracts and would be operated entirely at the risk of Renaissance Trains and their capital, and also entirely controlled by Renaissance Trains, except the DFT, who measured how many trains they could run per day. Now previously on the channel, I've looked at another open access operator, Rexman Shropshire, under my failed franchises series. Rexman Shropshire sadly failed due to competition clauses where the company were unable to call at major cooling points to preserve competition between other operators. Now, luckily for Renaissance trains, this wouldn't be the case of Hull trains. The main reason for that is GNER services to Hull made less than 20% of the company's total income. Thus, there would be little restrictions to cooling points for Renaissance trains along the proposed route to KGX, thanks to this 20% rule. These Hull proposals weren't universally supported though, especially by the original franchised operators of GNER and West Anglia Great Northern. West Anglia Great Northern, in particular, were angered as they wanted to extend some of their Peterborough services to Doncaster and would struggle to get into profit if Hull trains came to be. And also, they would struggle to get paths to the route. As well as this, Rail Track, the precursor to Network Rail, were unable to find suitable paths for a potential Hull train service. Nevertheless, through the help of several local MPs who promoted the potential job opportunities and benefits for the local communities around Hull, Hull trains were granted permission for free return services a day from September 2000 until 2004, with an option for a fourth return service before then. Now all Hull trains needed was some rolling stock, rather important if you're planning to run a rail service. Luckily, Renaissance Trains' managers knew the rail industry well. Due to the success of privatisation in bringing passengers onto the railways, stock was becoming increasingly scarce, especially diesel ones, which were needed for Hull. Renaissance approached Brush Traction to see if they could construct some Class 43 HST locomotives. However, more strict crash worthiness standards meant the design of the HST would have to have been completely redesigned, something that was not at all justified for the small order that Renaissance envisioned. However, Hull trains would later actually operate some HST sets. Eventually, Renaissance found Anglian Railways could provide them with some spare Class 170 turbo style DMUs on hire. The units would be ideal for whole trains, with them having 29 first class seats and 129 standard class per free car unit. Hull eventually acquired four of these free car Class 170s. So with track access given and the units acquired, it was time for whole trains to be launched. On the 25th of September 2000, whole trains launched their London to Hull service. Due to the lack of time before their approval by the DFT and promised service starts, Hull Trains had to rely on sister company Anglia Railways and their drivers, who could now sign from Norwich all the way to Hull. So with the launch of Hull Trains, let's look at the route and stations the company originally served. The service from Hull to King's Cross originally took around three hours, and originally called at after Hull. Brough, Selby, Doncaster, Retford, 
Grantham and King's Cross, although Stevenage was sometimes served on Sunday services. Although early passenger numbers looked good, just a month later, tragedy struck. On the 17th of October 2000, a GNER Intercity 225 derailed at 115 miles an hour near Hatfield in Hertfordshire. The incident, caused by metal fatigue on the tracks, cost four lives and injured more than 70. The incident hugely affected the East Coast Main Line and thus held trains. Speed limits were reduced across the network and safety precautions tightened. The most damaging aspect was rail travel fear and led to just 80,000 passengers carried in whole trains this first year of operations. Promising, but not as high as they had hoped. In 2001, whole trains were hit with a stock problem. The Strategic Rail Authority announced that assets used by franchised operators could no longer be loaned out to open access operators. This was an issue for whole trains, with the Class 170s being Anglian railway units loaned out to the operator. So they had to find a way to acquire brand new units by 2004, when the new Greater Anglia franchise began, and whole trains would have to give up their 170s to them. Whole trains decided that these new units would be brand new class 170s. The units would be able to have a traditional first class meal service served through a full buffet counter. Yes, a buffet counter on a class 170. A bonus of them being ordered for use for whole trains instead of Anglia Railways. In 2002, there were several instances where a class 86 and Mark II carriages were used to haul some services to Doncaster in the event a class 170 was unable to be procured. To solve the stock shortage and the fact that the 170s could not reach 125 miles an hour, Hull Trains ordered four Class 222, four car 125 mile an hour DEMUs, with an option for them to be increased to five carriages in the future. The units, financed by HSBC leasing, were able to be constructed cheaply due to the same design being used for the Midland Mainline units. The units were expected to enter service in 2005. This was coincided with an eight-year track access extension until 2010. Also in 2002, the timetable was increased to four trains per day on weekdays and three on weekends. This saw an increase of 425,000 seats per annum, still inferior to many stations with services to London, especially considering the large population of Hull itself. At this point, Hull trains had established themselves with their very high customer service standards and brilliant overall service. The encouragement of buying tickets on board had led to a positive staff-passenger relationship compared to the negative penalty fare atmosphere of franchised operators. Overall, Hull Trains was on the up, but 2003 posed a takeover that could have stunted its growth. The purchase of GB Railways, owner of the Anglia Rail franchise and Hull Trains with Renaissance, in 2003 for £22 million led to first now managing a majority of Hull Trains, leaving Renaissance with a 20% stake. This could have been bad for Hull Trains, with a large corporation like First having the power to turn Hull Trains into a purely profit-oriented company. However, this did not seem like it was the case. In summer 2004, the timetable saw a further service frequency increase, with there now being five weekday return services. This coincided with load factors increasing to above 80%, with 48% of all whole train journeys starting or ending at Hull. Thus, the Hull in Hull trains was the driving force of passenger numbers. Hull trains, now having four turbo star units, could double up some services to provide six carriages on busier diagrams, leading to a capacity of 610,000 seats per annum. By 2005, the company had hit over 1 million passengers, and to celebrate, whole trains were able to introduce their brand new Class 222 Pioneer units into service. The four-car units were a huge upgrade to the 170s. The units had a full intercity layout, and the 125-mile-an-hour top speed allowed journey times to be reduced by up to 25 minutes. Just before the units entered service, the Office of Rail and Road Regulator allowed whole trains to up services to six return journeys per weekday, bringing annual capacity to 766,000. The Class 170s were reallocated to another first operator, Scotrail, for services between Glasgow, Edinburgh and Inverness, routes that they still operate to this day. Although passenger numbers in summer 2005 dipped following several attempted and successful terrorist attacks on London, Overall numbers for the autumn and winter were above 80% load factors, impressive with the large capacity increases on whole trains. In 2006, whole trains reconfigured their Class 222s to increase first-class seats on the units from 22 to 33 seats by removing a third of standard class seating in the adjacent coach. First class was in high demand, especially with complimentary hot food cooked on board using a steam oven similar to airlines. It was not too difficult or expensive to serve hot meals either, with no onboard chef needed and cheaper food used that just needed heating up. Overall, this cheap, efficient first-class meal service 
allowed hot meals to be served on weekends as well as weekdays, maintaining consistency and differing from the franchise operators along the line. In 2007, an accident occurred at the Crofton Bombardier Depot, where the Class 222s were maintained. 222103, whilst being lifted, fell and caused large frame distortion on two of the carriages. Although the unit was originally written off, repairs were able to be carried out on the unit, although it never ran for whole trains again, taking two years to repair. Despite being a train down, the immense Class 222 reliability allowed whole trains to run a full timetable. Eventually though, repair work caught up to the 222s, and a diagram using a Class 86-1 with Cargo D Mark III coaches and a driving van trailer were used for services between Kings Cross and Doncaster. Whole trains didn't forget about Hull though, with connections being made onto a whole train shuttle service or another operator's services. Hull trains went as far as to paint the DVT into BR blue, with the whole set looking stunning. However, of course, this system couldn't last forever, and by 2008, the infamous Class 180s had been relieved of service by First Great Western. Although unreliable, Hull trains believed these 2001 125mph DMUs could be used for assets. Originally, Hull trains required two units to replace the Class 86 and Mark III set and allow more 222 maintenance. It was also around this time that Hull trains rebranded to incorporate first branding under the original first Hull trains name. Also around this time, Hull trains were exploring options of running new services from Kings Cross to Harrogate under the Harrogate trains brand name. This came with the East Coast mainline capacity upgrades, but sadly for Hull trains and Harrogate trains, everyone wanted a piece of the pie. In 2009, it was announced that Hull Trains had been granted permission for seven weekday returns and five weekend return services until at least 2014. Grand Central and GNER's replacement, National Express, were also granted more service track rights, but the Hull Trains service to Harrogate was not granted. Hull Trains would have used five Class 180s and four Class 222s if the Harrogate service was granted. As it wasn't, Hull Trains now only needed one class of train, it was decided that whole trains would keep the class 180s only, with the 222s joining the rest of their 222 family with East Midlands trains, which allowed East Midlands trains to begin services on the reopened Corby line. The class 222 withdrawal did pose some problems, even if the class 180s added capacity to whole trains. The reliability of the 180s, as they were with First Great Western and other previous operators, were, well, shambolic. They achieved a grim 9,000 miles per technical incident, the Class 222s, for comparison, could achieve over 50,000. This led to frequent cancellations, especially in the summer of 2009. In 2010, the decision was made to maintain these units at Old Oak Common, their original maintenance base, rather than the more convenient Crofton Depot. Hull Trains also asked Angel Trains to correct many of the 180s faults, with reliability slightly improving. Hull Trains also announced that they had gone to Brush Barclay in Kilmarnock, to begin a refurbishment scheme of the 180s, returning interiors to as new condition, as well as upgrading catering equipment to provide an even better service. The Class 180 branding was also changed with the first dynamic lines livery used, whilst the new whole trains logo was applied with a pink heart, the same as today. To go alongside this long-term fleet commitment, whole trains were granted an extension of track access agreements until December 2016. The use of five Class 180s now brought average annual capacity to over 1.25 million. Despite the 2010 economic downturn, Hull Trains' passenger numbers were still high, and Hull itself was seeing the benefits. In 2013, Hull was selected as City of Culture for 2017, something which put Hull on the map and boosted passenger numbers significantly. In 2014, first announced that they had wholly brought out the Hull Trains company from Renaissance Trains and other shareholders. However, in the same year, Hull Trains also dropped their first from their name, simply becoming Hull Trains again. In 2014, Hull Trains trialled real-time information displays on their Class 180s, being the first operator in the UK to do so, and allowing minute-by-minute -minute route updates to improve connections and information on board. In 2015, Hull Trains announced that it would be investing £68 million in five brand new 140mph Class 802 bi-mode units to replace the five 180s. Hull trains initially were looking for fully electric replacements, however delays in electrification at Hull meant that they had to set up a bi-mode IET sets. The units would be much more environmentally friendly and allow for higher reliability on the line. However, until their anticipated introduction date of 2020, the 180s would have to do. In the same year, in February, 
Hull trains extended one weekday return service to Beverley, and later in December, one return service on weekends, meaning Beverley got served by London services for the first time since privatisation. In 2016, Hull trains were rewarded for their investment and continued high satisfaction rates by being given a 10-year track access rights extension until 2029. Following continued reliability problems with the 180s though, Hull trains were forced to loan in two HST sets from Great Western Railway. These sets significantly improving punctuality and allowing for further Class 180 maintenance to be carried out, without affecting timetables, which it had done previously. The HSTs would remain until the new units entered service. And by 2019, earlier than expected, Hull trains introduced the first of five Class 802 Paragons. The units allowed a capacity increase of 5,500 seats per week, 286,000 per year. They also brought with them more reliability, a more environmentally friendly ride, as well as USB and plug connectivity, free Wi-Fi and at-seat trolley services. An electric reservation system also decreased turnaround times, and the trains looked stunning, emblazoned with place names that whole trains served. Although the new trains wouldn't reach their top speed of 140 mile an hour due to delays in the East Coast mainline route upgrades, they would speed up services due to a much improved acceleration. The redundant Class 180s were then sent to East Midlands Railway to replace their final HST sets and eventually moved to Grand Central. However, just months later in March 2020, whole trains were forced to suspend all operations amidst the COVID-19 pandemic and faced doubts whether they would ever restart services again due to financial constraints. Luckily, thanks to support from members of Parliament and First Group, Hull Trains fully restarted services in April 2021. In August of the same year, the track access agreement was extended until December 2032, all but confirming Hull Trains had survived the pandemic. By 2023, Hull Trains were back at their best, being confirmed as the UK's most reliable train operator in October. Hull Trains had averaged only 1-2% of service cancellations, the best in the UK. Martin Gilbert, Hull Trains Managing Director, suggested this was a testament to all the staff members, with Hull Trains being able to deliver superb services regardless of the circumstances. It was also announced that the IET AT300s that Hull Trains operated were the most reliable in the UK, with new food options introduced later in the year. In January 2024, it was announced that first we're applying to run a new London King's Cross to Sheffield service. The company, if the service is accepted by the Office of Rail and Road, could start operations as early as 2025. In February, it was announced that whole trains had led to up to £380 million of economic boost to the whole region. The report suggested that since operation, the company had increased connectivity in the region, enhanced capacity, and had brought £70 million worth of employment to the region. Gilbert said that the open access operator scheme had allowed whole trains to provide a lot to the area, with the report highlighting that whole trains had not spent a penny of taxpayer money but achieved and inputted so much to the whole region. To add to the positive news, in March 2024, it was announced that Hull Trains had been given the Golden Whistle Award, alongside LUMO, for its efforts in reducing delays over an annual average. The Class 802s were pivotal to this improvement, and it showed that Hull Trains were providing the best services possible, even 24 years after they were founded. This seems like a perfect time to thank my members and donators, especially first class member Mia Jane, and business zone member Anthony Harris. Thank you, and do consider joining yourself to get shout outs and early access to videos, as well as more, from as little as 2 99 a month. It helps me so much, and I really do appreciate it hugely. Also, do check out my Discord server in the link in the description below. Thanks again. Anyway, that brings us to the present day. In 24 years, Hull Trains has gone from a concept on a whiteboard to one of the UK's most beloved rail operators, with modern, fast and green rolling stock, as well as consistently good reviews and reliability, proving the open access operator system really can work and benefit the cities that it serves. I do hope you've enjoyed the first video in this new series, where I look at all the open access operators. If you have done, please consider liking and subscribing, as well as joining the channel. Thanks so much for watching, see you in the next one, goodbye.